we begin, just another reminder, please check your phones, laptops, anything that makes annoying noises during talks. Make sure they won't make annoying noises during talks. And actually, look at your phones, take them out of your pocket. Make sure they're, they're quiet. That would be really useful. Thank you. Um, we'll just wait for these last few people to come in, and then I suspect the doors will close. So uh, welcome to the first of these stream sessions at PyCon 2017. Our first presenter today is Victor Stinner, who is going to be telling us about optimizations which made Python 3.6 faster than Python 3.5. Please make Victor welcome. So hi, everybody. I'm here to, um, to tell you which optimization made the Python 3.6 faster than Python 3.5. Uh, I'm Victor Stiner. I'm working for Red Hat on uh, OpenStack. My, one of my j job is to port OpenStack to Python 3. And the good news is that uh, most unit tests pass already on Python 3. So we have close to port this giant project, which is something like 3, million, 3 million lines of Python code ported to Python 3, and uh, sometimes I'm also working on Python. So we will sh first uh, start to discuss how to get stable benchmark. We'll receive uh, the results of the different Python version to finish with the optimization of the different version of Python. So benchmarks. Uh, one year ago, in March 2016, uh, in fact, uh, almost no one uh, trusted the benchmark of Python because um, if you run the same benchmark twice, once it will take that the benchmark makes Python faster, and the second time it will say that the pe benchmark makes, makes Python slower. So we, we didn't know if we should trust them, and some people just decided to only focus on micro benchmark or just hope that it, maybe it m will make Python faster. So to, to fix this issue, I started to write a new module called perf. Uh, the perf uh, does different things. First is uh, calibrate the number of bench, the number of loops to, to run the benchmark uh, long, long enough. It spawns multiple processes uh, to sec in sequence. Uh, it computes three values per process to, to get a total of uh, 60 values. It's important to spawn multiple processes because, um, in my experience, each process will get uh, different uh, performance, and it's nice to have uh, all kinds of uh, values to be able to, to get uh, more stable results, which means more reproductible results. Uh, to what you can do with all these values, um, in the old version of the benchmark suite, we use the minimum, but if you use a minimum, there is a known issue called the local minimum, which is that uh, if you run the benchmark once on a, the benchmark a new time, you don't get the same value because uh, you need a very long list of values to really find the, the minimum of, of your computer. And uh, if you use the average, it's much more um, reliable because you, because you, you smooth the values between the maximum and the minimum. And another important tool coming from stat statistic is the standard deviation. It gives you an idea of the range of uh, where most of your values are, and it also gives you an idea of uh, the stability of your benchmark, because if the range is too big, it probably means that you have an issue on your benchmark, or maybe that you have an issue on your system. The performance project uh, is a new project hosted on GitHub. Uh, it's a new version of the benchmark suite, uh, now using uh, perf. And the good news is that the speed.python.org is already running uh, performance. So to, to get uh, st stable uh, results, um, my first issue was, was the code locality. It's something uh, related to very low level stuff of the CPU because depending on the exact layout of the code in memory, you don't get exactly the same speed. And to get uh, stable results, you, you can use the uh, LTO, which is a link time optimization, but also the PGO, profile guided optimization. And uh, the, the other kind of issues is the system itself and the hardware. Um, 
It's not easy to, to explain everything in a few minutes, but in short, so just use my command uh, perf system tune. It will, it will tune your system to run benchmark. So for example, it will use the fi uh, fixed CPU frequency. Because you have to know that uh, nowadays, uh, CPUs are not running at the same speed every time, all the time. Uh, in fact, the frequency is changing like all the time in each core of your CPU. And uh, depending on the workload of the other CPU, depending on uh, the temperature, depending on a lot of stuff, you don't get the same speed. So that's really, um, with, with, that's really an, isu an important issue. And the, the workaround is to use the fixed uh, frequency. But also, uh, you have to disable the Intel Turbo Boost. Uh, it's a feature of um, Intel CPU. The idea is that if you only have a one core uh, active, it means that the CPU can run, uh, for example, 20% faster because you, the, the CPU tries to limit the power consumption, but if there is only one CPU active, it's a, it is able to use more current for a single CPU. So we don't just want to disable the switcher, so we don't depend on the, uh, on the workload of the other CPUs. And uh, Linux has a super cool feature called CPU isolation. Uh, in short, the idea is that you tell the scheduler to never schedule uh, any kind of task on uh, one specific CPU or a CPU set. And uh, later, you will pin your, your process on this specific CPU. So you will be like alone on the CPU. You will not get any kind of interruption. And uh, it it's makes the benchmark much more stable. So now we have super stable uh, performance. What uh, uh, super stable um, benchmark results? What can you do with that? Uh, the, um, the very cool thing is that you can very easily spot a performance regression because it becomes now obvious. For example, this one is a real example on Python 3.6 during the development cycle. Uh, the Python startup is a time to start Python before starting to execute in your own code. And um, the old performance was 20 milliseconds and uh, suddenly it, it becomes uh, 27. In fact, it was something related to a new import somewhere in the code. Uh, the good thing is that we spotted the, the issue, but also that we, we were able to make Python even faster after the fix. Another important uh, thing, in my opinion, is the timeline. Uh, today we have uh, results over three years, and uh, it's important to see the world timeline because um, sometimes we, we, um, we tend to, to focus on very tiny things, on micro benchmark, or on very small uh, issues, but it's good to have the overall pictures of your world application to have an idea of the, the performance and the trend also. Uh, for your information, this one is a telco benchmark. And the good thing is that we are getting faster and faster. Okay, now the results. Uh, as announced in the title, Python 3.6 is faster than Python 2.5. Uh, these results are normalized to Python 3.5, which means that lower means faster. Um, I, I wasn't able to display all results because uh, there are something like 60 benchmarks. So I only picked the, the one which are the most significant. And uh, if you still have to be convinced, uh, Python 3 is faster than Python 2. Um, and I think that today it's even more uh, right than it was a few years ago, because you, you can now see that the, the difference is quite significant on this, on this benchmark. benchmark. Uh, and uh, if you are using SymPy, the good news is that uh, it became between uh, 22 and 42 percent faster, which is quite good. Uh, it means that only by changing the version of Python, it becomes much faster. And just for the fun, there is um, an interesting benchmark, which is a telco. Uh, basically, it's a benchmark on the decimal module. The decimal module computes a uh, number in using the decimal base and not the, the binary base. And uh, Stefan Kra uh, re rewrote the module in the C language in Python 3.3. .3. 
And uh, today we are simply uh, 40 times faster in Python 3. Another very good news is that even if Python 3.6 was released only a few months ago in uh, December, we are already faster than Python 2.6. The thing is that uh, we, we had uh, some optimization uh, prepared, but we decided to not merge them uh, bef just before the release, to not take a risk of, of introducing regression. So we pushed them just after the release. And it's already quite faster. Okay, I would like to, to focus on some optimization made on, in Python 3.5. What I did is to, to analyze the results uh, of a, on the timeline and try to spot which optimization were the most significant uh, on the timeline. So in Python 3.5, the um, um, Matt Joyner, Alexei Kashayev, and uh, Sergi Storchaka re-implemented the functools.lru cache in the C language. It made the uh, SymPy 20... 20% faster and, and SciMark LU 5% faster. But it was quite difficult to, to implement this optimization because uh, a cache is something quite complex. The, there are many corner cases, and uh, if you convert your code to the C language, you have even more tricky, tricky issues. So it took something like three years and a half to close, um, to close the issue to implement the optimization. Uh, in Python 3.5, Eric now re-implemented the collection dot uh, order edict in the C language. It made uh, HTML5 lib 20% faster. Uh, and the um, implementation used the, is based on the implementation of uh, the Python dict type. And again, it was very tricky because uh, the, even if the API seems simple, there are many corner cases, and it took a lot of time to design new tests, to test uh, every corner cases, to fix some, some issues. So it took two years and a half to, to implement this optimization. And now the interesting part is Python 3.6. Uh, I didn't try to to sort uh, optimization by the gain. Um, the, I just wrote a list of the optimization. So the first one uh, is a change that I made on the memory allocator. So to understand that, you have to know that we have two kinds of memory allocation functions. Uh, there is a pi object, um, the pi object family and the pi mem family. And the pi object used an, an, an allocator called the, um, PM alloc, which is a fast memory allocator for objects smaller than one kilobyte, and objects which have um, which has a, a short lifetime. It's really efficient. Uh, if you try to disable it, it makes some Python something like 20 times uh, uh, 20 percent slower. So my idea was simply to use the pi object allocator on the pi mem family. But it was not that easy because um, the pi object requires to hold the, the gil, the global interpreter lock, and the pi mem uh, was using the system m lock, which doesn't require any kind of, of lock. So my, to, to be able to change that, I was asked to test some uh, third-party applications like uh, NumPy, uh, Django, uh, LXML, um, Pillow, and uh, the, good, the good news is that only, I only found one bug in NumPy, and it was quickly fixed. And uh, to, to make sure that we don't make any issues, I also implemented a new test. So in the debug mode, you are able to check if the, the GIL is held by your application. So it makes sure that you, you use correctly the API. So on many benchmarks, the, the code is between 5 and 22% faster, which is quite good only by changing two lines in the code. And uh, a very cool side effect of the change is also that you are able to, to get the debug hooks in the release of Python. Because when you develop a C extension, sometimes you, you get a buffer overflow but you may not be able to detect them um, as a first run because memory overflow are like random. So using uh, the environment variable pydebug equal uh, debug, 
you are able now to enable the debug hooks and to, de to detect um, different kinds of issues related to memory allocations. Uh, the next optimization, uh, in fact, is a follow-up of the PyCon Canada 2015 uh, uh, made by Bray Cannon. The, the keynote compared uh, Jiton, Aaron Python, PyPy, CPython 2, and CPython 3. And uh, Brett uh, noticed that um, one specific benchmark was much slower in Python 3. So he, opened, uh, he reported the issue. And uh, Sergey Storchaka, as usual, was very fast to identify the bug and to produce an optimization. And the optimization simply made the code twice faster, which is quite good. Uh, another more complex uh, issue is uh, profile-guided optimization. To understand that, um, the idea is that you compile Python twice. First, you compile Python using specific compiler options to say that we will trace the execution of your code. And uh, you run a specific task uh, with this uh, uh, custom Python, and you compile Python a second time using traces collected by the execution. And the idea is that using traces, you give hints to the compiler to say that mm, maybe this, this code is very, it's called often, it's uh, the hot code. This code is never called, so it's called code. But also, uh, even at a single conditional test in the code, uh, the, the tool is able to say that if you have two blocks, the true block and the false block, it is able to say that one block is more likely and if, if one block is more likely, the compiler is able to exchange the two block or to tell to the CPU that uh, maybe you, can, uh, you should optimize one case in favor, uh, in, uh, in favor of the other. And um, what Brett made on the, um, on the PGO compilation is that instead of using the P digit program, which basically computes um, digits of the P constants, he exchanged that to use the Python test suite. And the thing is that uh, the PyDigit only tests a very few functions in Python which are related to compute uh, integers. But uh, if you use the uh, Python test suite, you cover a lot more, um, a lo uh, you have a much better co code coverage, and so you are able to, to know much better which code is hot or not. And uh, the, the effect of the of this change, in my opinion, is very important because it's between 5 and 27 percent faster only by, by the compiler. So it means that you, you don't have to modify your Python code, you don't have to modify your C code. It's just that if you use the compiler correctly, it makes your co the, the compiler emits machine codes much more efficient. So it means that we, we have to be very careful on the compiler on how to use the CPU correctly because we, maybe we can still do better. Uh, the, the next optimization is called word code. Um, in fact, Sergey Storchaka proposed on the Python IDs mailing list to change how we store the bytecode because in Python 2.5, what we had is that Depending if an, um, an operation has an argument or no arguments, it took between two or three bytes. And the, the thing is that uh, in the very hot code of Python, the loop which evaluates the byte code in the cval.c file, uh, before, before executing each instruction, you have to check if you have an argument or not. And if you have an argument, you have to fetch the next two bytes and this is not something good for performance because uh, you, you introduced a conditional, uh, conditional code and uh, the CPU has to guess uh, if we will take the branch or not. So what was decided is simply to, to always use two bytes. So Dimur, uh, Rumed, and uh, Sergei Storchaka change the byte code to only, always use two bytes. And simply, if you don't have an argument, just put zero in, in the arguments. And so we were able to remove this uh, conditional code in the very hot part of the C eval. Uh, fast call uh, as a different story. Uh, in fact, we had uh, some crashes in the code on uh, specific optimization of Python. 
because in Python, the, the thing is that to call any C function, you have uh, to create a tuple. And uh, I expected the tuple to be very, quick, uh, very cheap because we have a free list to avoid memory allocation. We have a fast pass to, to optimize whatever we can in the creation of a tuple. But the, in practice, creating and destroying the tuple takes uh, 20 nanoseconds. But uh, if the function takes, uh, is really fast, something like 100 nanoseconds, 20 nanoseconds is significant. So we, we had an, an optimization trying to, to cache the tuple, to reuse the same tuple for all calls. But uh, using a cached tuple uh, created a lot of corner cases which were very tricky to, to work around. So what, we, what I try to do is to just remove the tuple and pass directly a C-array of pointers. So you don't have to, to, to change the reference counts. You don't have to, to allocate memory on the heap. You can allocate memory on the stack, which is much faster. And obviously, you don't uh, use tuple, so you don't have to, to call the garbage collector. And um, I, I was surprised that, he, that it's really faster. And in, on many micro benchmark, it's between uh, 12 and 50% faster. I'll uh, give you some example of uh, optimized uh, function. It's like getting the first item of a list. It's like getting an attribute using the get attr function. Uh, the get method of a dictionary, the, um, the count method of a list, the replace method of a string, so in fact, a wide range of functions were optimized just by avoiding the tuple. And uh, the, the other cool thing about that is that you don't have to modify your, your C code because uh, the many functions were optimized internally. So you just, just have to use the C API and it's getting faster. Uh, for Unicode Codex, uh, the story is that uh, Naoki Inada reported an issue because he is working on a uh, PyMySQL. And in PyMySQL, he's decoding uh, data from the database. And um, to decode data from the database, he wanted to use the surrogate escape error handler. But if you do that, you, you are getting bad performance. So I look at the code, and in fact, I found very inefficient code, and I was able to, to optimize them quite a lot. For example, for the UTF-8 uh, codec, the decoder is 15 times faster, and the decoder is 95 times faster, which is quite good. And the ASCII encoder, uh, the ASCII codec, the decoder is 60 times faster, and the decoder is 3 times faster. And uh, in a Python 3.5, we decided to reintroduce uh, bytes formatting. Uh, for basically, it was for the Mercurial and the Twisted projects who, who use bytes in many places to discuss on the network or on the file system. But uh, the code was inefficient, so I developed a new API called the PyBytes Writer. Basically, the idea is to, to be more smart in the way you allocate memory, or maybe even you allo avoid allocating memory to work uh, only on the stack memory. And using, more, using this API, uh, the formatting becomes twice faster. And the, for example, the from x method to create a bytes object became three times faster. Uh, globbing is the operation of listing the content of a directory using a pattern like Give me all, pic all uh, JPEG uh, pictures. And uh, to, to optimize, th optimize that, Sergey Storchaka used the new uh, os.scandir -scan functions. The, the idea of this function is that it not only returns the file name, but also the file's attributes. Uh, so on Unix, on Windows, you don't get the same, the same attributes. But the idea is that at least you are able to, to know if the file is a a regular file or a directory without any further syscall. So the glob function is between three and six times faster, and the pass lib glob became, became be between 1.5 and four times faster. For AsyncIO, uh, Yuri, Yuri Selivanov on Naoki Inada 
uh, identify that we, we create a lot of future on task functions and um, we create them, we destroy them. So the idea was, was simply to re-implement these functions, these classes in the C language. And uh, just by doing that, the async IO programs are now um, 30 times, 30% 30 times, 30% faster, which is very good. And uh, to finish, the optimization made in Python 3.7. Uh, the first one, it was made by Yuri Selivanov and Naoki Inada. It's to add a new opcode to load a method and to call a method. The idea is that internally we can avoid some operation and make the code more efficient. So the, big, the method calls became between 10 and 20 times 20% 20 faster. But the idea comes from uh, PyPy, we, who implemented this idea a few years ago. We had a lot of ideas to optimize Python even further, but I, I prefer to not discuss them here because I'm not sure that we will implement them. I'm not sure that they are really efficient, so just stay tuned. And now the bad slide. <laughs> I have a bad news. We still have some benchmarks which are slower, but um, I will not go in depth in this benchmark because in my opinion, they are, they are not really bottleneck for your application, but you have to know that we, we are good, but there are some cases which are maybe 10% or 20% slower. And uh, the interesting part is a very high bar. Uh, in fact, it's a Python startup. On Python 3, we are something between two and three times slower uh, for the Python startup. Even if we made very, very good uh, progress on that part, we are still slower, so we have to find a way to optimize that. If you want to know more about that, you can go to the Python speed.python.org. You, you can browse all data, you can compare Python version, you have access to the timeline. And there is also a website, um, which are basically my notes, how to optimize Python, and I also explain why we cannot implement some, some optimization. Do you have any question? Uh, everyone, please thank Victor. <laughs> so we have time for one to two questions. So if you think you have a really good question, <laughs> uh, please line up at one of these microphones in the aisles here. Yeah, over this side. Thanks for the talk. Am I on? Yeah, cool. Um, I was wondering if you can speak to what the outcome of the Fat Python project was and kind of what we may have learned from it. So, so the question is about PyPy? Oh, no, the Fat Python project. That was oh, the Fat Python project. Yeah. Um, in fact, I started to work on Benchmark uh, because of Fat Python. Uh, to, to explain you, uh, I was working on a project which is a compiler ahead of time we generate a specialized uh, code uh, using guards check at runtime. And the idea is to emit a better bytecode um, by using some assumption on the code. Uh, but the thing is that I was not really able to check if it's faster or not. So I prefer to focus on benchmarking and maybe also focus on a much simpler optimization. But I'm still working on that uh, as a side project. And that is all the time we have for Victor. So uh, please thank him again for a wonderful talk. And uh, we'll be starting up here again in about 10 minutes' time.